Hi, my name's Kate Clanchy and I'm a writer. Um, and I have written short stories. This is my book of short stories, They're Not Dead and Saved. And the title story of that collection won the Fierce Pritchett Prize and the BBC Short Story Prize. But I didn't start out as a short story writer. I started out as a poet. Um, and that's influencing my choice of what I want to talk to you about today, which is about images in the short story. Because I think that in many ways, short stories are closer to poems than they are to novels. Um, and that's because of the way that they're built on images. So if you read a novel, you might think of the images as, you know, the memories and the metaphors as being a bit like color illustrations, the things that add something to the black and white prose, to the story, to the plot as you go along. But in a short story or a poem, the images can be the plot and be the characters. And that, that's why it's worth building on them and really working on your skill in using them in your writing. But it's all very well to talk in theory. I think it's better to look at a good example. So I'm going to show you an example by the um, great American short story writer, Tobias Wolf. Um, Tobias Wolf's very famous in the States. He's one of those writers who writes that kind of a clean, clear New Yorker style. Um, and this is a first short story. So it was published, his first short story published. It was in the Atlantic, which one of those wonderful journals like the New Yorker, which gives work, still gives work to American short story writers and money to sh American short story writers in a way that we just don't have an equivalent here. Um, came out in 1976, but it's set in the world of some years before that, I think it's set in the 50s. Um, and it's two boys traveling to an American prep school, so like a boarding school. Um, so it's like the world you might be familiar with from Catcher in the Rye or certain films. Um, and Tobias Wolf was a scholarship boy himself at one of these schools. And here he is looking at, well, here's a narrator looking at a similar scholarship boy. I noticed Eugene before I actually met him. There's no way not to notice him. As our train was leaving New York, Eugene, moving from another coach into the one where I sat, managed to get himself tam jammed in the door between his two enormous suitcases. I watched as he struggled to free himself, fascinated by the hat he wore, a green alpine hat with feathers stuck in the brim. I wondered if he hoped to reduce the absurdity of his situation by grinning as he did in every direction. Finally, something gave and he shot into the coach like a pickle squirting out of a sandwich. I hoped he would not take the seat next to mine, but he did. He started to talk almost the moment he sat down and he didn't stop until we reached Wallingford. Was I going to charity? What a coincidence, so was he. My first year, his too. Where was I from? Oregon, no shit. Way the hell and gone up in the boondocks, eh? He was from Indiana, Gary, Indiana. I knew the song, didn't I? I did, but he sang it for me anyway, all the way through including the tricky ending. There were other boys in the coach and they were staring at us and I wished he would shut up. Did I swim? Too bad, it was a good sport. I ought to go out for it. He'd set a freestyle record in the Midwestern Conference the year before. What was my favorite subject? He liked math, he guessed, but he was pretty good at all of them. He offered me a cigarette, which I refused. I ought to quit myself, he said, be the death of me yet. Eugene was a scholarship boy. One of his teachers had told him that he was too smart to be going to a regular high school and gave him a list of prep schools. Eugene applied to all of them just for the hell of it and all of them accepted him. He finally decided on Kuwaiti because only Kuwaiti had offered him a travel allowance. His father was dead and his mother a nurse had three other kids to support. So Eugene didn't think it would be fair to ask her for anything. As the train came into Wallingford, he asked me if I would be his roommate. I didn't jump at the offer. For one thing, I did not like to look at Eugene. His head was too big for his lanky body and his skin was oily. He put me in mind of a seal. And then there was the matter of the scholarship. I too was a scholarship boy and I didn't want to finish myself off before I even got started by rooming with another, the way fat girls hung out together back at home. I knew the world Eugene came from. I came from that world myself and I wanted to leave it behind. 
To this end, I practiced over the summer an air of secret amusement, which I considered to be aristocratic, an association encouraged by English movie actors. I'd studied the photographs of the boys in the prep school bulletins, and now my hair looked like their hair, and my clothes looked like their clothes. I wanted to know boys whose fathers ran banks and held cabinet office and wrote books. I wanted to be their friend and go home with them on vacation and someday marry one of their sisters and Eugene Miller didn't have much of a place in these plans. I told him I had a friend at QAT and I'd probably be rooming with him. That's okay, he said, maybe next year. Ooh, what a stinker. I know the astonishing way that the images are used in that passage, actually it's a passage I used to um, show people how to write speech as well, because the way that the Eugene story is told and integrated into the direct speech is really superb. But the cunning thing about that passage is that you're on the, the narrator's side and seeing through his eyes before you know it. So you see Eugene the gherkin popping out from behind in the slice of bread seats and you're laughing and you see Eugene the seal with his thick neck and you slightly dislike him and you think how clever you are with your analogies. And then you realise that this narrator whose head you're in is an absolute stinker who wants to, who judges fat girls for hanging out together in his hometown, someone who's at war with himself who doesn't accept that he's a scholarship boy, who finds nothing to admire in this amazing character, this Eugene, who's launching himself into a prep school, powered by pure brain, who only wants to take care of his struggling mother, who's good in every way. And we are on the side of the person who's snobbish about him, and we see him as a gherkin. So that is image as character, image as plot. The plot of this story is going to be between these two boys between the good and the bad and the snobbish values and the not snobbish values. And there it all is. And it's set going in a couple of pages. And that's what images can do. So what you need to do now, what I'm asking you to do now is to think about your own images and work on your own images. Because it's probably not something you've been asked to do very much because the, make, the capacity to make images isn't something that we really very, we value very much in English education. So Kate is very imaginative was something that was said about me in school, but it was usually juxtaposed with Kate can't spell, she can't organise herself, all the other different things that I was failing to do. Imagination is a kind of fey and silly thing to be, be able to do. But to make images, actually, that's how you can sell yourself or anything else to any other corporation. It's how you advertise things, it's how you make political speeches. So this is a little game about encouraging your imagination. And again, I'm just going to show you some notes about how it works. So what I want you to do is to think of character. So it could be a character in a story you're already writing, or it could just be like, you want to start writing a, a story and you've got a feeling about a character. Maybe you've heard somebody say something, maybe you've got just like little inkling in the corner of your mind. Maybe you've got a name for them. Let's think about what this character's like. Let's play if he were. So Eugene's a gherkin. What vegetable is your character? Eugene's a seal. What animal is your character? What insect? Free associate, use those different bits of your mind that you don't usually use. What drink do they drink? What drink are they? What car are they? What weather? What dog? What sofa? Just really go for a whole list of things you want to associate with them. And what about other things? What about associated images? Can you start to put flesh on the bones of this character? Eugene's got this magnificent hat and it comes back at the end of the story. Fascinated by the hat he wore, a green alpine hat with feathers stuck in the brim. Hats are good. Coats are good outer things because they collect lots of bits of the world. They're, you know, they're liminal between the world and character. What outer coat does somebody wear? What about a pair of shoes? 
What about a bag? Big bag, small bag, pair of suitcases. You might even know what's in the bag. What's in the pocket? Where are they sitting? Now they might like to talk. And then there's a whole other exciting thing. It's a short story, not a poem. Who's seeing them like this? If you characterize somebody as a pink flower and a daisy and a claw and a mayfly, is that a woman? Is it a man seeing it like that? What kind of a man sees somebody like that? And from those images, you can start to build your story. And you can use images for other things. You know, you can think about the setting, because sometimes the setting tells a story. But the other thing I would tell you to do is to try to listen to the images inside your head. Because if you're a short story writer, the idea for a short story might sometimes come in images. You might want to say, I, you know, I want to tell a story that begins on a bus and ends with a geranium. Well, trust yourself. Create those images, create those sentences, and let the meaning come from the images. It's a different way from saying, I'm going to tell a story with a twist. I'm going to create a character and give them a disappointment. But it's a very truthful way of telling a story, and it will lead you to characters and to meaning in ways that you know you might find unexpected. And if you just yeah, discipline yourself a bit. And next time you're thinking of a character, think about the images that are associated with them. Good luck and good luck with your stories.